for uh, participating. And I'm specifically going to thank Dr. Scott Frame for helping me put this panel together. So this panel is on uh, bank regulation since the financial crisis. And these panels will talk on a specific area, so I'll introduce each panelist and their topic now. So we're going to start with Dr. Beverly Hurdle, who is the Senior Vice President of the Federal Reserve of New York. And she will be talking about the objectives of the bank supervision. She will then be followed by Dr. Robert DeYoung, who is the Capital Federal Distinguished Professor of Financial Markets and Institutions at the University of Kansas. And he will be presenting on the process and regulation procedures on the insolvency of banks and the systematically important financial institutions. I had to Google that one myself to make sure I knew what SIFI stood for. Um, then we have Dr. Scott Frame, who's the financial economist and is a financial economist and senior policy advisor at the Federal Reserve in Atlanta. And he'll be presenting an overview on stress testing. And last but not least, we will have Mark Cust, who is a model valuation executive at Alley Financial, who will be talking about how all of this basically is going to impact and also affect the financial institutions themselves. So on that note, I will let Dr. Beverly Hurdle start. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me without the microphone? If I mm -hmm. Stand closer to the microphone. I have to begin, like all Federal Reserve employees, by offering the disclaimer that my views today are my own and do not represent the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. I also want to spend just a minute to frame my remarks on the supervision of large, complex uh, financial companies. The view I'm offering you today is as a research economist and not as a supervisor. Those are distinct roles within the Federal Reserve, and I am definitely on the research side of the house. And everything I'm going to talk about today is based on public information and not going to really talk about individual firms or events. My remarks are going to focus on prudential supervision of bank holding companies, which are the parent organizations that, uh, that own commercial banks and other uh, financial entities and are one of the kind of entities that the Federal Reserve supervises. Um, there are many other, uh, import, I'll explain what prudential regulation is, so just note there are other important areas of supervision that I'm not going to talk about today around consumer c compliance and supervision of other kinds of institutions. In my remarks today, I want to make three key points that I hope you walk out of here with. The first is I want to talk about the distinction between supervision and regulation. Two, I want to talk about the goals of supervision, um, as has been expressed by the Federal Reserve, both in micro-prudential and macro-prudential terms. And finally, I want to talk about some of the challenges that researchers like myself, and hopefully some of you, would face in trying to think about assessing the effectiveness of supervision. And I probably should note overall that I have many more questions than I have answers in this presentation, but I do think they're important questions. So first, let's talk about supervision and regulation, particularly in the context of banking companies. So the first point I want to make is that supervision is distinct from regulation, but the two activities are often confused. You read lots and lots of papers where the two words, supervisor and regulator, supervision and regulation, are used interchangeably. Um, but they actually mean um, distinct, if interrelated, things. So what does regulation mean? Regulation involves defining the rules. In a banking context, those rules involve things like who can own and control commercial banks, what bank holding companies and commercial banks can and cannot do, that is permissible and impermissible activities, um, and another kind of requirement, uh, regulation involves sort of minimum requirements out there for these companies to operate with lesser regulatory restraints, and here I'm thinking of sort of capital and liquidity requirements. There are other kinds of regulations as well, but those are kind of, you know, some of the ones that uh, are probably most familiar. Supervision, in contrast, involves monitoring and oversight of the firms. So one part of supervision is, in, is monitoring and overseeing compliance with regulation, that whatever the rules are, the companies are following them. Another important part of supervision, and this is where the prudential supervision comes in, is trying to understand whether the firms are engaged in any unsafe or unsound practices. And unsafe and unsound, and it's, con it's double converse, safe and sound, 
are sort of two terms of art that, um, well, they're, act they're actually in the regulation, in the Bank Holding Company Act, and some of the regulations that, I mean, some of the laws, I should say, that authorize um, supervision. But it's, um, it, that's where the prudential part comes in, and I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. And finally, the third uh, sort of element of supervision is uh, you know, m making the firms take remediation steps to make them correct any unsafe or unsound practices that are discovered as part of supervision. So supervision and, and regulation are related and they're intertwined. As I said, they're distinct. Why do we see, you know, in terms of sort of common understanding of these terms, a lot of overlap? Um, in part because, as I just noted, some part of supervision is assessing compliance with regulation. Um, I also think there's overlap from the fact that the information and insights gained from supervision can help shape the regulatory agenda. So the kind of market and industry knowledge that supervisors get from having been in working with the firms and understanding their businesses can help on the regulatory side in designing efficient regulation. It also can be that the you know, identification of emerging risks, new activities, new market practices that come through supervision and monitoring can help highlight the need for new or um, revised regulation. So in the ideal, you have this kind of virtuous circle of supervision informing regulation, regulation informing supervision, and so on. And just at a very practical level, at least in the banking world, regulatory and supervisory authority are often housed within the same entity. For instance, just as an example, the Federal Reserve is both a regulator and a supervisor of bank holding companies. So, what are the implications for research? Um, since supervision uh, and regulation are often conflated or confused, I'd argue there's not a lot out there, either empirically or theoretically, that distinguishes the two. That's not to say that there isn't research out there that is about supervision. Some of the examples of that kind of research, there's a whole uh, bunch of papers, including one that I wrote a number of years ago, um, looking at supervisory ratings and trying to understand uh, you know, how those ratings work, how they relate to other sources of information. Uh, there's a set, whole set of cross-country studies based on surveys um, that ask about the characteristics of both supervision in regu and regulation in different countries and then sort of compare cross-country differences with, out with outcomes. But again, they aren't really focused on supervision versus regulation per se. They're kind of all in there together. And finally, there's some papers that look at sort of the governance and, and implementation of supervision. But there's little analysis that sort of asks or looks at the question, what's the contribution of supervision per se, either as a complement uh, to regulation or as something that has maybe a distinct set of goals and objectives. And therefore, there's very little analysis of the effectiveness of supervision as distinct from regulation. So let's talk a little bit about, in more detail, about what would be the first stage of thinking about some kind of regulation, some kind of research like that, which is thinking about what the goals of supervision might be. So what I've done here, I'm, I'm not going to read these quotations out loud to you, is I've extracted from some public statements by the Federal Reserve Board of Governors and by the New York Fed talking about the goals of supervision. Um, and, you know, they're to promote safety and soundness of the supervised institutions. That's the, the unsafe and unsound, safety and soundness, it's the, it's the converse. The stability of the financial system and compliance with laws and regulations, as I just said. Um, there's uh, quotations that note, um, you know, that supervision of, uh, supervision promotes a safe and uh, stable banking system and that it complements, the, this is in reference to our supervision of a large, complicated, uh, financial institutions, it complements other central bank responsibilities. Oops. So, let's see, the key themes are that there's both microprudential and macroprudential goals. What does microprudential and macroprudential mean? They're kind of um, the latest uh, buzzwords in regulation, particularly since in supervision, particularly since the financial crisis. Microprudential relating to the safety and soundness of individual firms and macroprudential relating to the stability and sound functioning of the entire financial system or banking system. I mean, there's different contexts in which it can be applied. Um, I would also note that these particular statements focus on very broad outcomes. 
not on specific targets or triggers. There are perhaps other statements that you could find that would be a little bit more specific. But in thinking about these kind of broad goals, the safety and soundness of individual firms, the stability of the banking and financial system, you know, what are some of the challenges of coming up with something a little more concrete and specific, a supervisory program, if you will, that sort of puts those, you know, makes them sort of workable day-to-day -day things. The first, is, I, I would argue, is the definition of what safe and sound or unsafe and unsound means. Um, this, uh, I think, interpretation involves a lot of judgment. It's not hard-coded into regulation. In, in, in many cases, remember, this is the supervision part of things. That there is a whole set of written guidance, including what are known as supervision and regulation letters or SR letters, supervision manuals, all kinds of internal guidance that bank examiners have that help them assess and make decisions. But over the long run, you know, or even over the intermediate run, there's a trade-off between having these definitions of what constitutes safe and sound practices be flexible so that they adjust to new practices and conditions in the markets, but also have them be stable and predictable so that the firms understand what the expectations are and, and can take actions to, to meet those expectations. And as I noted, there's <coughs> often a lot of room for interpretation. Another challenge in, in thinking about putting these goals into practice is to think about what is the role of the supervisor versus the role of the supervised firm, in particular its management and its board of directors. What is the firm itself responsible for? What is the super, supervisor responsible for? Where do they share some kind of joint, um, joint responsibility? Those things I just talked about are sort of micro-prudential oriented. I think on the macro prudential side, there's some really good questions around, okay, what does a stable banking system look like? How would we know if we had one or we didn't have one? Does a stable banking system mean there are no failures? Does it mean there are no big losses? Does it mean there are just no disruptive failures or losses, whatever disruptive means? How disruptive is disruptive? And thinking about sort of the frequency of disruptions or failures or whatever you know, bad things that are going to happen versus the severity of, of those events. Um, those are all questions. I'm not going to give you an answer on any of that today. And the final thing to think about is that resources, I argue both resources at the supervised institutions and certainly at the supervisory agencies, are finite. So there has to be decisions about how best to deploy them, both the number of people and the kind of people that um, staff the supervisory agencies and the activities that those people engage in. What should and do supervisors do? So I want to spend the next couple of slides talking a little bit about what, um, what supervisors do, what bank holding company supervisors do. Um, and I kind of break this down for myself into three, two or three different kinds of activities. First, there's sort of what I would call ongoing monitoring. Uh, there are supervisory teams. They follow a particular firm or a depending on the size and complexity, a set of firms. Um, and monitoring includes meeting with senior management, business line management, risk and control departments, and, and board members. It re uh, involves review of all kinds of internal reports, the risk management reports, performance reports, budget reports, strategy reports, board reports, uh, anything that the senior managers and decision makers want to see. Those reports can be qualitative or they can be quantitative. Uh, they can be regular or they can be sort of ad hoc reports. Um, so there's a lot of just monitoring what's going on inside the organization um, on an ongoing basis. Related to that, but distinct are examinations. Um, you know, in the sort of canonical model of bank exams that, um, you know, was probably true, uh, you know, 20 years ago, you know, once a year, everybody came in, you looked at the bank from, or the banking company from top to bottom as a moment in time, and that was a bank exam. That has not been the model of, of examination for the larger, more complex firms. It, it probably still holds for a lot of the smaller institutions, but that model has not been in place for many, many years at the large institutions. They're subject to sort of continuous monitoring and oversight. So examinations then become you know, structured, deeper dives in particular topics or issues or concerns. 
Uh, the focus can be to fill some kind of knowledge gap, something that the supervisory team doesn't feel like it knows about, enough about and wants to understand better so that they understand the risk or the business that the firm is in better than they do. Exams can be designed to assess internal controls and processes at the firm to see whether they're robust, whether the firm is following them the way they, they say that they are, um, and you know, to identify weaknesses across any of those uh, fronts. Uh, examinations can also involve be just an exam at an individual firm related to issues at one firm, or they can involve coordinated assessments across several firms known in the business as horizontal exams. And the third kind of thing that goes on in supervision is, this is particularly for the large complex firms, there's a series of on, or the largest complex firms, a series of ongoing programs um, that happen um, year after year, um, and they have, the, I listed a bunch of acronyms, but it's the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review, or CCAR, which is a view, review of capital planning and capital adequacy, the Comprehensive Liquidity Analysis and Review, which is a review of liquidity positions, and the SRP has to do with, with resolution. And these are uh, horizontal programs uh, focusing on the, the very largest and most complex of the bank holding companies. Um, so that phase of what supervisors do is kind of the information gathering phase and analysis. There's also the, okay, what do you do with the information? There's a series of enforcement actions and other steps that can be taken to require firms to address any unsafe or unsound practices you know, require a timeline for remediation. Some of these actions, particularly the most severe ones, are publicly are publicly announced. Uh, others of them are confidential. Typically at any time there will be, um, if not enforcement actions, at least um, observations made about the firm, many, many dozens of them at any, fir at any firm at any given time that are being worked on. Some of them are joint agreements, like a consent order where, you know, the firm and the supervisors both agree this is the problem, this is the step, set of steps that will be taken. Others are, you know, imposed without uh, consent or agreement. So that's one output. Uh, another output which uh, is important in the supervisory realm is ratings. There are confidential supervisory ratings, uh, one to five, one is the best, five is the worst. Uh, the particular uh, rating system that we have now is called RFIC for risk, financial condition, risk management financial condition impact, which is about the impact on the depositories and the consolidated rating. These are confidential ratings, uh, not public, but a bad and the firms care because a bad rating uh, can uh, have consequences in terms of certain actions, uh, limit, limits on actions. Finally, some of the programs I mentioned before, the CCAR and the CLAR, there can be specific consequences that come out of those programs. For instance, the CCAR, uh, depending on what happens exactly, can result in limits on uh, the dividends and repurchases that a firm is allowed to do. So um, that's a very rapid uh, overview of what supervisors actually do. I want to think, turn a little bit now and think about what does this mean for assessing the effectiveness um, and what are some of the challenges in assessing the effectiveness of supervision? Well, as I just said, much of supervision is confidential and not publicly observed, both the activities and many of the actions. So uh, inside the Federal Reserve, the researchers, we can sometimes get access or often get access to certain amounts of information from outside the Federal Reserve. Um, that information is some of the you know, most closely held information and, and it can be very um, you know, difficult. Um, I think there's a challenge in thinking about what is the output of supervision? What's the objective function? What exactly do we measure? How will we know? What, what do we measure to say if it goes up or it goes down? It's high, it's low. Um, that's good supervision or it's effective supervision or ineffective supervision. Um, and um, another uh, challenge, uh, again, not unique to this realm, is um, observational equivalence. If the goal of supervision is stability of the system or stability of individual banks and you observe that the system is stable and the banks are stable, is that because that's good supervision or we just haven't had a shock yet? So that's sort of similar to the monetary policy, uh, sort of good luck or good policy question. And a final question I think Bear is more thinking about is are all failures or big losses, uh, big loss events, signs of supervisory failure? Did, if, if a bank fails, if there's a big loss, does that mean that the supervisor somehow failed? 
or an alternative way of asking the question is what what event rate is acceptable? What are what are the trade-offs? And I think um, research and you know both theoretical and empirical sort of thinking about that um, uh, would be very valuable. So I'll end by just saying I think there is a lot of room for theory and empirical research, thinking about the goals of supervision, what supervision can or should contribute relative to regulation. Is there some analog between soup and reg, sort of hard information, soft information, something about contracting theory that applies here? And how do we think about how the question I was just speaking about, how to measure and assess supervisory effectiveness in banking, are there analogies from other industries? Banking is certainly not the only regulated and supervised industry out there. Are there other analogies? Um, and thinking about uh, public versus private information. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Jason, thanks for, thanks for having me and thanks for arranging and making it easy to get here. Uh, and participate. Uh, I changed the topic. I changed the title. I changed the title, not the topic of, of my presentation. This is a a, a less a less complicated title, but a, a rather grandiose one. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, resolving failed well, CIFIs, as, as Jason discovered, stands for. Uh, and I did do a bad thing. CIFI stands stands for um, a, a systemically important financial institutions. Uh, these are the in more common parlance, another four-letter four acronym, too big to fail banks. Okay. Um, and uh, 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 my presentation, well, how I like to think about regulation here is a little different than, 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 than Bev's dichotomy, uh, where, where, where she split regulation and supervision into two groups, which is an important way to think about things. Um, of course, you can split things many ways. Uh, I like to think about regulation and supervision as well as ex ante and ex post. Now, everything that Nearly everything that, that, that Bev talked about was, was ex ante regulation. Uh, things like uh, uh, bank supervision, um, restrictions on activities, um, uh, minimum liquidity ratios, minimum capital ratios, and these, this regulation of supervision is designed to prevent the thing that I'm here to talk about, right? It's, it's designed to prevent largely banks, banks from failing, or banks from failing in a very inelegant fashion, right? Uh, ex post regulation. Um, uh, there's really little, very little of it, but but uh, I think I think ex post regulation, meaning uh, resolving large, resolving failed banks, resolving insolvent or illiquid banks, and what we're really interested in is the uh, our ability to to resolve large complex uh, banks. I, I generally think that too big to fail is is probably the wrong way to think about things. I'll give you an example in a few slides. Too complex to fail is the problem, right? If a bank is too complex for us to take down. Um, uh, then we have ended up having to bail bail them out, and, and that has attendant uh, moral hazard problems and problems of equity and and, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, accusations uh, actually found that accusations that the market's rigged, etc. Well, there's three ways we can think about this ex post this ex post task of resolving failed banks. One is we can seize and shut down the insolvent bank, and the FDIC has been doing this for um, for 75 years now. And, and uh, 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 this is uh, in the U.S. We think we don't think think anything of this. Uh, if you go to Europe uh, right now, they're still in the process of setting up bank resolution authorities uh, uh, over there. Uh, the the uh, de facto thing to do in Europe for, for 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 decades, generations, was when a bank failed, we we we, we nationalize it or we subsidize it, and then we set it up, and, and and on it goes, and it doesn't fail. Right? It's very very rare. Uh, but uh, but the FDIC, this is a, the FDIC we know insures our deposits, so we know that if our bank's in trouble, we're not going to lose all our money. But the FDIC, of course, also resolves the bank after after it, it gets into the state where where deposit insurance has to has to pay off. So so 95 out of 100 banks are higher than that. 98 out of 100 banks, right, that go become insolvent are seized and shut down by the FDIC, and it's a it's it's a process the FDIC has learned to do over the generations. And it, it, the FDIC uh, uh, staff resolution team goes into a bank that's in trouble on Friday afternoon, or by Monday afternoon, it's all cleaned up. There's a new sign on the front of the bank. It happens. Uh, it, it's almost like a commodity transaction. The FDIC knows how to do this for banks that are relatively small and not complicated. 
Uh, in fact, 7%, 7% of the uh, commercial banks in the United States became insolvent during the recent financial crisis, and all but a handful of those were seized on a Friday, reopened on a Monday, during a, a FDIC, uh, 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 as part of an FDIC, um, generally a purchase and assumption transaction, but, but a resolution, right? This is something the FDIC does well. Uh, in some cases, the banks are too complex, and we have to bail, we have to bail out the banks, and we know all, know all about these examples. Uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there was another way to do it, and that was just ignore the process, right? Just, just uh, uh, hear no evil and see no evil, and we would just let uh, insolvent thrift cliffs exist. As long as they were liquid, as long as they could keep doing, keep, keep doing business, uh, we just let them go and hope things would get better. So, so uh, what we want to do is this first bullet. This is really what we're after. And, and, and my idea, if we go, back to, uh, we go back to that first slide, where I have X anti-regulation, and since the financial crisis, we've added more and more and more and more ex-ante regulation. If we can do the ex-post regulation better, if we can bail out bank, if we can, if we can resolve banks without having to bail them out, no matter how complicated they are, and the market realizes that we can do this, then there's going to be less need for all the ex-ante regulation. Okay, and this is why I have the grandiose title, right? This is the challenge of our time, because, by, because now this is pie the sky stuff. But if we can make X post regulation work better, there's going to be less need for X anti regulation. Not, not no need for it, just, 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 less, just less need. Um, I like to say there's no bank in bankruptcy. And she asked the question is, well, we have bankruptcy code. Why do we need this special government entity called the FDIC to, uh, to take care of what we might think otherwise is a bankrupt bank? Well, think what bankruptcy code does. It protects an insolvent uh, institution from its creditors. A bank's creditors are depositors and people with lines of credit. You know, from a, from a macro prudential standpoint, from a macroeconomic standpoint, we don't want depositors not having access to their money, and we don't want uh, um, um, borrowers not having access to their lines of credit because it has macroeconomic consequences, right? So, so, so the FDIC has, has, has regulatory authority. In 1929, when the FDIC was, was, was founded in 1933, but um, uh, Joe Mason and um, um, is it Jim Kalari, and I, I'm, I don't know the other co author here, uh, did a, uh, a piece of research. They looked at the banks, national banks that failed in 1929. And they said in the first year after the failure, now that they were being resolved under normal bankruptcy law, the first year after they failed, uh, depositors got 13% of the deposits, got access to 13% of their money. And these processes, on average, took four years to straighten out. And at the end of four years, depositors only ever got 66, on average, 66 cents on every dollar of deposits. Uh, if you think about that example, and then multiply this by hundreds of banks becoming insolvent during the, during the, during the Great Depression, you see that we have a, a problem that affects the economy. Massive losses of liquidity here, and of course, runs that happen because people lose faith in the banking system. Uh, so the FDIC was founded, and, and like I said, uh, since then we've learned how to do these, do these, uh, do these uh, failed bank resolutions without depositors losing any money. Uh, I'm going to give you a very stylistic example of a bank resolution. Here's a simple bank. It's a $150 million bank. It's got about, oh, about 7% equity, and uh, it's funded mostly with insured deposits, which the, FDIC, which the FDIC will protect regardless of whether the bank fails or not, and then some uninsured deposits. I don't know, I'm betwixt and between, I have too much technology here. I'll use my <laughs> finger. I'll use my finger. Okay, so, so what, if, uh, what if this bank, uh, if $25 million of loans default? So the balance sheet changes now, right? Right, this bank's liability is now 140, its loans are only 125, the equity is gone, the bank's insolvent. All right, what does the FDIC do? And I'm going to make this a short story, but I mean the FDIC has been watching. They, they know this is in progress and they're doing some work in the weeks ahead of this, but on a Friday afternoon they show up at the bank and they, they walk and they say, we're from the FDIC and we're here to help you. Uh, <laughs> and they seize the bank, of course the owners are wiped out, the managers and directors are fired. Um, the FDIC arranges, and they've been doing research on this, they've got a list of banks who are interested in, 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 in buying failed bank assets, should a bank near them that's strategically good for them a fail. So the FDIC arranges for a healthy bank in the area, generally, to purchase the failed bank's assets, okay, purchase these loans, and assume the liabilities. Now, now assuming liabilities is a crazy thing. If you're, you're going to get the whole bank, right? Uh, uh, so so you're, it's called a P&A. Um, a P&A um, uh, merger or acquisition, purchase and assumption. Purchase the assets and assume the liabilities. Um, 
The bank opens up on Monday with a new sign. Um, uh, the insured depositors have access to all their funds. There's always some question about whether the uninsured depositors have access to their funds. And it all depends on whether or not, whether or not the FDIC and the acquiring bank can agree on how much those loans are worth. Now, what if the bank says, um, I agree with the FDIC, these loans are really worth $125 million, all right, but I'm willing to assume the liabilities, except I'm only going to assume, um, I'm only going to assume $25 million of the uninsured depositors' liabilities. The insured depositors receive access to all their funds, the uninsured depositors take what we call a haircut, they lose $15 million. Okay, so there's many flavors of how this happens, but here's the general idea. Recognize the equity holders are all wiped out. The uninsured depositors lose a portion of their funds, or lose access to a portion of their funds. The, uninsured, the insured depositors uh, on Monday morning have access to all their funds. But, and, and I'm about to talk about asset, um, asset valuation. Um, what if the acquiring bank doesn't believe these loans are really worth $125 billion, which, which, is a, which, is, which, is, which is believable, right? This bank's been losing money hand over fist. Let's say the acquirer only thinks they're worth, only worth $90 billion. Uh, um, okay. And, you now these insured depositors, they're not pure liabilities, right? These are customers that always come to your bank, and, and, and you may be able to sell other financial services to them. And, and, and they're not likely to withdraw their funds because they're, they're, you're not paying them very much. They're insured funds. And, and uh, their core deposits, this, this funding is not going to really run away. So, so it's worth something. And it's not uncommon for the acquiring bank to pay four cents or five cents or six cents on the dollar to, to essentially buy the liabilities. That's a strange concept for much of us. But, but these, are, th 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 these, are, these are customers as well. So let's say uh, this bank is, worth, is, is, is willing to pay $95 billion for this bank. Um, 90 for the assets, 5 for access to these, uh, these depositor customers. Uh, that leaves a hole, uh, remember the FDIC wants to make sure all the insured depositors are covered. That leaves a hole of $5 billion. $5 million, $5 million. So what happens? The FDIC in this case would inject $5 million into the bank or more than likely provide $5 million in loan guarantees. Some of which would be, which would be uh, paid off, and some of which w which wouldn't. In this case, the uninsured deposit would lose all their money. Okay, so this is kind of a, kind of a normal, it's a stylized situation, but 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 many 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 uh, PNA resolutions look like this. Now, what I said before, I want to make sure I repeat: the processes of asset violate of, of, of evaluation and also deposit determination are central parts of this resolution technology. We have to be able to do this for this. Friday afternoon to Monday morning resolution to work out quickly and work out well. Right? We have to be able to value these assets. Um, also, we have to know how many depo insured deposits are. And this sounds like a, a trivial question, but actually it's not. The FDIC right now is trying to get the largest banks in the country to, to report on a daily basis the amount of insured deposits they have are using and the brands they're attached to. Up until now, the FDIC hasn't had this information. So you can see the story I just told, you've got to be able to value the assets, you've got to know how much, how much insured deposits there are. Um, obviously, the process I just described didn't work for Citibank and Bank of America. This is a list of the 10 largest financial holding companies in the U.S. right before the financial crisis. Um, depending on how you count things, tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars were injected into these, in, into these, into these two uh, bank, uh, uh, financial holding companies. Uh, they, were, they, they were bailed out. Um, Wachovia, the FDIC was waiting in the wings uh, to seize the banking assets of Wachovia. They didn't have to because at the last minute, um, I'm going to go backwards. There we go. Wow, it's sensitive. Okay. I'm not going to touch it. Okay. Um, <laughs> At the, at the last minute, Wells Fargo outbid Citibank for uh, for, for for Wachovia. Um, so uh, so so here's a case where the FDIC was 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 about ready to seize and, and start a, a resolution process. Uh, Washington Mutual. This was the largest uh, bank resolution the FDIC has ever done. And although it's a smaller by an order of magnitude here, only 350 billion dollars of assets. Um, that's that's large. That's very, very large. That's, that's a huge, it's the seventh largest, uh, eighth largest banking company in the U.S. at the time. The thing is, Washington Mutual is a pretty simple firm, right? It was a mortgage bank. 
Right. So, so uh, um, the FDIC was, was able to do this. In fact, they resolved it. Uh, they arranged a purchase and assumption uh, merger with uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and did not have to inject any funds. Um, okay, so that's a big end. Like I said, set, these are four examples out of the top ten, uh, the largest ten banks. Um, of the banks below, smaller than this in the U.S., 7%, 7% of the rest of the banks um, uh, in, in the country, we're talking about hundreds of banks, uh, failed, and the FDIC was able to handle, handle the resolution without any trouble. Um, so, since these episodes, um, we've, uh, uh, we've uh, increased the amount of X anti-regulation, and uh, we've also tried to provide for better ex-post regulation as well. The, the, the new supervisor and regulatory processes, and I won't go into, in, into, into which laws or which international agreements uh, provide for these things, we want to try to improve the speed and accuracy of failed bank valuations, uh, facilitate the use of bankruptcy court by insolvent bank holding companies, if possible, and um, allow, if necessary, the FDIC to go in and um, seize and resolve failed situations like Bank of America or, or Citibank, uh, rather than having to bail them out. Uh, here's some examples of the new, uh, 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 of the new measures. Um, restrictions on derivatives transactions with proprietary trading. Um, uh, these are activities, number one, that are difficult to value in a hurry. right? So, and and uh, counterparties can run away from the failing bank. Uh, making the situation worse. So we're moving towards a situation where, 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 where banks are going to um, um, buy and sell more of their derivatives on exchanges, where they can be more easily priced and valued. Uh, agreements with the largest uh, 12, 11 or 18 banks in the, in, in, in the world to agree not to run if they're counterparties to the failed bank for two days. Uh, so we're moving in that direction to try to stabilize and give time for a resolution to happen. As I said before, daily accounting insured deposits. Uh, Bev mentioned um, mentioned uh, resolution uh, regulation and planning, um, living wills or resolution plans, we like to tell them, which, which, uh, which are supposedly instructions, instructions that help uh, the FDIC uh, resolve, uh, resolve one of these complicated banks. Uh, the first round of resolution plans that were submitted to the FDIC were all turned around and said, no, these are no good, you have to do them again. So this is a this is a serious th this is a serious threshold. The idea is the regulator should have a, a plan in front of them that tells them where the assets are, uh, and how this bank should be resolved uh, if they had to, had to do it through bankruptcy. And of course, stress tests, capital buffers, pro cyclical capital, a lot of other increases in ex ante regulations. The ex post regulation I like to talk about is orderly liquidation authority. And the the Dodd Frank Act provided more power for the FDIC. Uh, this is an interesting point. Prior to the Dodd-Frank Act, the FDIC was not allowed to seize the entire banking company. They were only allowed to seize the banking assets. So as banks have gotten larger, they become financial holding companies, they hold, they hold non-banking assets, they have a lot of activities. The FDIC doesn't have the power to seize that whole company. Order liquidation authority will allow the FDIC to do that if, if, if necessary. Um, it gives the FDIC a large line of credit with the U.S. Treasury if they have to uh, need as many funds as, as they can to take care of this. And, um, this bullet here is the problematic one. Um, um, in order to exercise this authority, essentially the FDIC needs approval from the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury. Okay, so um, you can imagine that it may take some political courage to allow the FDIC to shut down one of these banks, especially if we have problems with two or three or four banks at a time, and they're just thinking about what happened after Lehman Brothers. Um, okay. Uh, the FDIC has the plan, they call it the single point of entry approach. They don't talk about the details of this very often, but they do say we have a plan. Um, um, the FDIC will seize the holding company, they'll create a temporary bridge bank that holds the assets and liabilities of the holding company. Senior managers exit, the FDIC appoints new managers to run this bridge bank, temporary. The subsidiaries of the bank, of the bank holding company, the bank, the brokerage, the insurance company, they'll all keep running. The idea here is, is, is to try to replicate what happens in a bankruptcy proceeding where the business keeps running while we're trying to work out a financial solution. Um, the FDIC will inject equity funding uh, into the holding company. Uninsured creditors will take some losses. Now, the bridge structure legally has a three to five year life the idea here is we want to have time to unwind, time to have all the contracts unwind. We end up with a simple bank, 
time to value the assets, and then we can sell off the assets in pieces. There's going to be losses, and they're going to be losses that the FDIC takes. The money the FDIC injects in here isn't necessarily going to be, be paid back. Like we talked about TARP, all got paid back, right? Or, or, or at least Geithner likes to talk in those terms as, as a big victory. Uh, the banking system will have to pay higher insurance premiums in the future to reimburse the Treasury uh, for these to rebuild the deposit insurance fund. Uh, the, the point here isn't that we're going to prevent losses from happening. Losses have to happen. These banks are insolvent. Somebody has to bear them. And basically the banking system is going to bear the losses in the long run. But um, uh, so the idea here, the idea here is, it, it is to take the bank offline um, and stabilize the situation. Um, so, like I said, will the FDIC prevent, be, be actually permitted to utilize its, its powers here? Now, um, I've got a little bit of talk I'm, I'm gonna, about how I think about these things. I'm going to skip past this because I'm up against my uh, up against my time. I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip directly to a, uh, a banking, a Senate Banking Committee hearing uh, last July, where I was I was invited to, to testify along with some other folks. The topic was uh, uh, what what makes a bank systemically risky. What makes a bank systemically risky. And um, uh, the chairman of the committee, who basically called the hearing, repeatedly asked the panel about this 50 billion asset size threshold. And this is the threshold that was kind of a line in the sand drawn. Any banking company with more than 50 billion dollars of assets has to have a lot more ex-ante regulation. Higher capital, higher liquidity, living wills, stress tests, etc. And these are burdens that banks have to, have to carry. There's some question about whether this $50 billion line was too high or too low. And repeatedly, 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 the panel was asked, what's the, what's the real number? What's the magic number that, that separates systemically important banks from non-systemically important banks? Um, and of course, none of us on the panel were willing to pick a number because we said, well, there is no bank number. We're economists, right? On the one hand, this. On the other hand, that. Uh, <laughs> finally, finally, Paul Kupiak said, I think Paul got tired of, of, of this, this question over and over, and he, he just wanted to bring it into the proceedings. He said, $100 billion. <laughs> which, <laughs> so, which made Sherry Brown happy, because Sherry Brown's senator from Ohio, and there's the size of the three largest bank holding companies, Ohio at the time. Okay, so, so when I say my biggest concern here isn't about finance or economics, we know how to do this. The biggest concern is politics. Politicians stand in the way. This is a talk Federal Reserve Congress wouldn't be allowed to give, <laughs> but, but but I could give it. Okay, so 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 we we can do everything we talked about before. We can do all that. We can do all that. But people stand in, people stand in the way, and they're called politicians. Thanks for being here. <laughs>
of the 19 largest uh, financial institutions. Um, the uh, Federal Reserve worked, worked with the firms uh, to try and size their capital needs and any capital shortfalls um, that were uh, identified were going to be met by a backstop through the Troubled Asset Relief Program or the TARP program. So we also remember those dark days in 2009 and, and uh, a year or so after that, the Federal Reserve um, decided that it, it wanted to um, sort of uh, codify uh, stress tests as part of its um, uh, regulatory or supervisory program. Um, and so stress testing has evolved into an annual exercise for these large institutions with two components. Um, uh, one is our uh, Dodd-Frank uh, stress test. So these were our stress tests that are mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act. These are purely quantitative exercises. Uh, firms cannot pass or fail. Dodd-Frank stress tests. And, and the test uh, results are, are based on, on three macroeconomic scenarios I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, the main focus uh, at the Fed, uh, the Dodd-Frank stress tests, I sort of think about uh, perhaps not entirely correctly is sort of being subsumed by a much broader program that the Fed itself put in place uh, known as the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review or CCAR program. I've uh, mentioned this briefly. Um, this is a quantitative and qualitative assessment of firms' capital plans. Um, and as part of this, we're going to measure post-stress capital ratios under a severe, severely adverse uh, economic scenario, um, assuming that a firm is going to go ahead and make all of its dividend and share repurchases that it has uh, outlined in its capital plan. Um, this is also going to be coupled with extensive uh, qualitative analysis of the firm's uh, risk measurement and management processes. And then at the end of this process each year, I believe in March, the Federal Reserve publicly objects or not um, to the firm's capital plans. Okay, so to give you a sense of, of what the quantitative exercise is here, um, each uh, November the Federal Reserve defines a nine-quarter uh, stressful uh, future macro financial uh, <laughs> environment. Um, and then the Fed and each of these individual firms are going to incorporate this environment into statistical models uh, that are used to project income and credit losses for each institution over the nine uh, quarter horizon. Now firms supply data inputs, uh, so the Federal Reserve provides these data uh, templates uh, and data is provided uh, provided to the Fed. Um, and the firms also supply their capital plans or, or what they intend to do in terms of dividends and share repurchases uh, over the next uh, two to three years. Now, models uh, to project income and credit losses, there, there are a large number of them. The Fed develops uh, their own, the firms develop uh, their own. Um, and there are also third-party vendor models uh, that are sometimes uh, used as well. The Fed also independently projects uh, firm balance sheets uh, to ensure comparability across firms. So they sort of limit uh, the firm's ability to uh, simply say they're going to uh, uh, const contract their balance sheets in order to meet uh, regulatory capital ratios that would sort of be uh, counterproductive. Uh, in this um, in this endeavor, firm generated balance sheet projections. So when the firm is conducting its own stress test, um, they're allowed to be more flexible in terms of excuse me in terms of uh, growth or contraction, but uh, they are required to be consistent with their income uh, projections. I think um, th there were some issues in some of the very first. Uh, stress tests where uh, firms would put together um, uh, their, their analysis under stress and sometimes um, different parts of their, their presentation or their submission uh, didn't jive with each other. Um, you know, they're going constri you know, to constrain their balance sheets but at the same time make you know, all this extra income and things like this. So they have to sort of put together a uh, coherent narrative. Um, 
The Fed then evaluates the capital adequacies of each firm uh, during the forecast horizon and then publicly discloses the results. Uh, the firm run stress test results uh, are evaluated by the Fed um, and are really considered as, as part of the qualitative review uh, of the firm's risk management. Okay, so in terms of these, these stress scenarios, like I said, it's going to be uh, a projection of macro, a set of macro financial variables uh, over a nine quarter horizon. Uh, these tend to be characterized by a recession, increases in risk premia, uh, and abrupt and severe uh, asset price declines. Uh, six firms with large trading operations are also subject to a global financial shock, which effectively mirrors uh, what happened in the second half of 2008. Uh, this last year's test also uh, included a counterparty failure. Uh, as I noted earlier, the Fed provides three paths for uh, these macroeconomic and financial market variables over the uh, horizon. Um, and for this past year, for example, uh, the Fed uh, projected 28 uh, data series uh, related to the real economy, uh, both domestic and foreign, uh, interest and exchange rates, and asset prices. Both the Fed and the firms then take these series uh, and use uh, this information uh, in the models as they uh, see fit in terms of what makes sense to them. Uh, can also involve sort of building off of, for example, there may be a path for uh, U.S. house prices, but we all know there's a lot of uh, variation in house price movements across the United States. So, so a firm may take the U.S. house price movements and then try to project uh, using historical data and come up with individual uh, house price projections for different geographic areas. You can also apply this you know, internationally with exchange rates and things like this. So, th so there's a lot of a lot of models, and you know, what you'll hear today, you're gonna say, well, the, the stress tests sound, you know, actually kind of straightforward, and they're not that uh, complicated, which at a high level I, I believe is true. But um, uh, there's an enormous uh, amount of resources uh, that go into um, conducting these stress tests, both at the firms uh, and at the Fed. Uh, these scenarios uh, tend to be uh, tuned to sort of the most salient uh, risks. Um, so as the Fed is coming up with its uh, scenarios uh, for the upcoming year, um, they're going to tend to focus on things um, that they're particularly concerned about, but then they want to also bring that into a coherent uh, macroeconomic uh, framework. So this is an area where it's not so much the financial economists are involved, uh, it's a little bit more on the, uh, on the macroeconomic side of the house. So here's just an example um, for unemployment rates. Um, the black line here uh, is simply uh, observed uh, unemployment rates since Q1 2001. Um, here is the, the black, oops, the black line continues. You were kidding this guy's quite. Oops. All right, anyway, here's house prices. Similar sort of story. Here's the path of U.S. house prices since 2001. Um, from this point forward, this is the, uh, you know, a projected baseline scenario of where we think house prices might go based on you know, like blue chip forecasts and consensus forecasts. Um, the uh, blue line represents the, um, the, ad, the stressful, the adverse scenario, the red line, the severely adverse scenario. So what the firms would be expected to do would be to um, you know, use their own models um, and in, you know, in the set of models for which they believe house prices are an important component, um, they're going to want to evaluate uh, their performance under this baseline scenario, this adverse scenario, and the severely adverse scenario. Uh, 
Um, firms incorporate these scenarios into their internal risk measurement uh, systems to produce quarterly forecasts of, um, the, the first thing is something called pre-provision net revenue, which is simply what would be what is going to be their uh, gross income uh, over the forecast horizon. This will be the sum of their net interest income uh, and their net non-interest income. So this is going to be a positive uh, number. Then they're also going to evaluate uh, banking book uh, credit losses by risk area. So they're going to go through different segments of uh, loan portfolios. They'll look at residential mortgages. They'll look at first. They'll look at second liens. They'll look at their credit card portfolios, their commercial portfolios. Uh, they'll also look at uh, their uh, securities uh, holdings. Then for the largest firms, um, they'll also uh, look or apply the global uh, trading shock and uh, evaluate uh, any uh, trading book uh, and counterparty losses uh, from those exposures. And so what we want to do is project how the stress environment is going to affect net income and capital uh, for each quarter consistent with U.S. accounting standards and our own uh, capital rules. Um, and this information is to be used by the firms as the basis for their capital plans, uh, which they're going to submit to the Fed. So the Fed is also, while the firms are, are uh, conducting this analysis, the, firm, the Fed has also uh, built its own models and conducting its own independent analysis uh, for each financial institution. Um, and we're going to uh, look at the post-stress capital ratios at each quarter end. Um, firms must remain adequately capitalized over each of the nine quarters over the stress horizon. So you can think about the, the, um, the implementation of these stress tests as, as really creating a new set of capital requirements. So we have minimum capital standards, and then now they have, the banks have to meet each of these capital standards uh, under stress, so it's had a had a profound uh, impact on uh, capital in the uh, banking system. Um, to give you just a sense here, I'll just sort of look at one of these bar charts, but I just want to give you a sense of the accounting here. Um, this pre-provision net revenue, the net non-interest income plus net interest income is going to be uh, a positive number. Then you're going to deduct off. Uh, projected uh, credit losses that's indicated here by this uh, burgundy bar um, we have some some losses on securities trading and counterparty losses and, and some other losses so you can see this is aggregated over the nine quarters but you can see uh, these are actual numbers for the uh, the banking system as a whole um, you know, so they're going to earn income over these uh, uh, over these nine quarters. We're going to have to deduct, deduct off any credit losses or uh, market uh, related losses. So, for a particular firm, uh, you might have a, a starting um, level of capital. For example, here, uh, a banking organization has 14% capital to assets. Um, it's expecting. Uh, to or the uh, net losses uh, over the nine quarters would erode six percentage points of capital. Um, the Fed will also uh, account for the fact that the firm said in its capital plan that it was going to pay out dividends and engage in share repurchases over these nine quarters. So you deduct that off, and what you're left with is sort of a post-stress um, amount of capital. And, and whatever's left here, the amount needs to um, exceed the uh, minimum capital standard. How much time do I get left, Jason? Uh, about three minutes. Okay. Um, I'll talk uh, briefly about um, types of models. There, there are a lot of different uh, models out there for uh, modeling uh, credit risk in different asset classes. Um, you know, we're familiar with things like value risk models. Um, for uh, securities portfolios, uh, we have to uh, project the income. So there's a lot of a lot of different um, uh, models for different types of, of assets and income streams. 
Um, and then we also delineate um, between what I would call top-down models uh, versus bottom-up models. Um, and these top-down models refer to, you know, sort of fairly simple models using publicly available and aggregated data. You sort of think of this as time series analysis at the firm or industry level. Um, Bev has, um, has a uh, staff report. She worked on a, on a particularly useful uh, top-down model for um, the uh, systemically important uh, financial institutions. Um, so you can sort of think of those as, again, sort of aggregated, high-level um, analysis. There's also some models that are what we call bottom-up models. They're going to tend to be built on um, proprietary data that come in from the firms. It's going to tend to be very granular. Um, you know, in the mortgage space, you might think of this as like using mortgage-level data, loan-level data to build uh, mortgage default and prepayment models, you know, we're up, uh, there's literature on these sorts of things. Um, those would be examples of bottom-up models. Um, the top-down models are a lot easier to build. They're easy to put in different types of scenarios and look at sensitivities to different assumptions. Um, they are a little limited and they can't identify important differences within asset classes across firms. They're going to sort of treat uh, all commercial loans as being, you know, of equal risk, for example, because you're not conditioning on any sort of firm-specific characteristics. Um, in terms of model governance and, and uh, disclosure, um, I, I know, you know, for the firms, this has been, uh, uh, and for the Fed, this has been sort of a learning experience over the last uh, four or five years trying to put in a, a model governance program. Um, the uh, banking uh, supervision authorities put out some um, uh, supervisory le letter back in 2011 on model risk management. Uh, the Fed has then took it upon itself to uh, hold itself to similar standards um, and developed a, uh, a model oversight group that oversees model development and implementation uh, of all the models that are, are developed and implemented by uh, economists around the uh, Federal Reserve System. Uh, I believe ben, you're still on the model oversight group. Um, I, for a time, was on something known as the, the model validation unit, which was an independent group um, that reviewed models for conceptual sign, soundness, documentation. You know, basically, um, in academic lingo, we would provide referee reports to the modelers. Uh, and then there was also, we were building out sort of an audit type function that would not go beyond the referee report, might actually look at coding, things like this, just to make sure that the models were actually doing what the, you know, economists said they were doing. It's just another set of eyes. Um, the Fed doesn't disclose its model specifications or parameter estimates. This has been a source of... Um, Friction, I think, with, the, with uh, some of the financial institutions. Um, but I think we learned uh, the, our prior experience with stress te tying stress test output um, to capital requirements was the OFEO, risk-based capital stress test for Fannie and Freddie. There they put all model specifications, parameter estimates. They published them in the Federal Register. Um, and what we found is, is Fannie and Freddie were able to really game the stress testing uh, program. So there's a real tension there. The firms, on the other hand, understandably want to better be able to, um, you know, do their business planning and, and would like to have a better sense of, of what's in the black boxes. Okay, to wrap up, uh, the Fed has increasingly embraced the use of quantitative decision-making tools and supervision, most notably through a stress testing program. And I try to give you an overview uh, of our process. Um, we first uh, define oops, uh, stressful macroeconomic environments um, over the nine-quarter horizon, uh, collecting data from each of the firms on their, on their book of business, uh, incorporating the data in the stress environment into statistical models used to predict income and credit losses, um, and then uh, ultimately evaluating the capital adequacy uh, of the firms over the horizon, and then disclosing uh, those results. Thank you. Now we have Mark Pease. The last in a panel like this is that I've got to hear what my colleagues had to say, or in this case, uh, my panelists had to say. 
And that's really informed some of what I can say. Um, but before getting into all that, I want to again thank the FMA and St. John's for inviting me to give this talk and to speak with you all. And uh, we'll go on from there. Now, as the other presenters did, I've got a disclaimer here that these thoughts and opinions expressed are mine, and not necessarily those of Ally Financial or Ally Bank or any Ally affiliated uh, individual or group. Uh, furthermore, <laughs> I want to stress that much of what I'm going to say here is purely anecdotal. It's from my own experience at, at two firms and also from uh, frequent interactions with my friends and colleagues at other firms. The final part of my disclosure <laughs> is that I currently work for a firm that just recently exited TARP. <laughs> and I previously worked for a firm that was, that had, what was it, the way you said it, had the FDIC waiting in the wings <laughs> before Wells Fargo came in and, uh, and rescued Wachovia. So I'm not sure what that says about me or my qualifications, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and try to address <laughs> this, this topic here. <laughs> try to address this topic. Okay. All right, so the, the actually, I'm going to back up really quick. Which way is back? Okay. So this was stress testing and other supervisory challenges from the bank perspective. I'm going to mostly focus on stress testing, but I'll talk a little bit about a few other things because they were also mentioned. Okay. It's very appropriate that this is called a stress test. Right? It does stress the financials of the firm, it stresses the capital plan of the firm, but it also exerts tremendous pressure and stress inside of the firm, on all levels of the firm, from the board of directors down to the rank and file. There is a tremendous amount that goes into running these tests. We've heard that from the top level, level they sound you know, pretty straightforward. You've got, in the case of CCAR, let's say 28 different macroeconomic uh, variables, series. Well, we take our models, we put those in the models, and you should be able to come up with these estimates. Well, these 28 series, uh, they're, they're excellent, they're all very informative and insightful, and, they, and the shocks that are provided in the adverse and the severely adverse scenarios make a lot of sense. And every year, a very large book of guidance is provided to guide us through CCAR. The problem is, or one of the problems here is, that the models that we employ, and I should also say for another point of identification, I work in model risk management. Uh, I've worked in model validation. I've been a modeler for many, many years, uh, and about 10 years in finance. In any event, we may use several thousand data series to drive our models. So one of the very big challenges, just operationally from the get-go, is how do we apply these 28, or whatever, whatever number it is each year, to how do they map to our thousands of inputs that we use for our models? And then there's a the fundamental question of how do we even choose the models? How do, we, how do we even identify the models from within our inventory that, have, that are CCAR significant? Some of them may not be. We have lots of models that have nothing to do with, with, with uh, capital adequacy. We have things like um, anti-money laundering, uh, operational risk models. They don't have any direct impact to things that may go into CCAR, but the outcomes of those models may themselves be inputs to other models that could themselves be now uh, inputs to capital adequacy, capital planning. So that's, that's quite a tremendous exercise. But as I said here, Many levels. The board of directors are ultimately responsible for, for the entire firm, but also for the stress testing and, and the, the capital advocacy plan. Uh, within the risk management organization, the chief risk officer uh, uh, has a very big role to play. Uh, within the lines of business, how do the stress test results and how do the implications of the scenarios that are presented for the stress test, how may they affect our line of business planning, our strategic plans. Uh, we're going to offer this product. Well, maybe that product could be, could have a worse impact under the, the severely adverse scenario. 
maybe it's the wrong time to bring it to market, those types of things. Compliance and internal audit uh, is, a, is a very large function within a firm the size of Ally or say Wells Fargo. And they have uh, well-defined roles in all of these uh, uh, regulatory and supervisory activities. We couldn't pull any of this off without significant investment in information systems and infrastructure. Treasury and finance, of course, uh, uh, in many firms, owns the CCAR function. And then human resources and, and compensation. You know, one of the big fears that uh, many firms have or, and that you hear a lot is these demands are driving the best talent out of the banks and into other kinds of financial services firms. Uh, and we do see that. Um, in order to uh, uh, avoid that, we have to have compensation strategies and human resource strategies that are targeted towards retaining this type of talent under these revised um, uh, uh, rigor that the regulators and the supervisors uh, impose upon us. And I want to pause there for a brief second to thank uh, Beverly, uh, for that, uh, for describing the difference between regulation and supervisory, uh, I think I was probably one of those who often used them interchangeably, but I think I have a much better sense now of how to uh, not do that anymore. Okay, so there is a lot of impact and stress to the firm, but we, we don't forget that we brought this upon ourselves. You know, just, just a couple of days ago, in preparation for coming here, I was looking through some old articles, and I found one of my favorites from 1992. It was that article from that, that quoted Alan Greenspan of saying, you know, if we relax regulation, maybe that will loosen up lending and, uh, and uh, the desire of firms to borrow. Well, I don't know if that truly precipitated what happened in 2008, 2009, but I don't know. Um, we didn't do a really good job of self-regulating lending and entering into markets and getting into these uh, uh, rather, I mean, I'm a modeler and I'm a quant, okay, but when I think of structures nowadays like, you know, CDOs and CDO squares and synthetic this and that, I don't know what we were thinking back in those days because they are very complex and they're hard for someone with even the proper training to understand, but we got into those to crazy degrees, especially if you look at companies like, like AIG, I mean, what was their total uh, exposure to those products, trillions of dollars, it was huge. Okay, so where does this leave us now? Well, the best in class firms, who I will not identify, uh, are, are seeking to strategically incorporate uh, regulatory and internal stress testing into all levels of the organization. I've already said up here that there is impact to all levels of the organization. But saying that there's impact versus saying uh, integrating uh, uh, the responsibility or integrating the, the expectation of stress testing are two different things. On one hand, it's a burden. On the other hand, it's a tool to help us strategically and to advance our, our, uh, our goals. While unfortunately, you know, the rest of the pack, which we'll also not name, uh, continues to perceive these as onerous bureaucratic exercises that sap resources and morale. And, you know, there is, let's see, I'll go back and do a little more background. I've worked in government research. I've been an academician. I've been an entrepreneur. I've worked in large technology firms. Now I work in, in financial, in the financial markets. And I don't know if I've ever been in, envir in, in a professional environment that is as stressful as December leading up to CCAR submission. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a frenzy, uh, and uh, it keeps a lot of people uh, up very late nights. Okay, so what can we do then to evolve the use and practice of stress testing from the supervisory mandated exercise uh, strictly for regulatory compliance into more of a strategic element of the firm culture? Okay, I think that's the key challenge as I see it. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mind shift change, it's a culture change. There are many organizational challenges, we'll just describe some of those to so do a little bit more. 
But the main challenge is it's, it's really, it's a mental game, right? Uh, and how is this accomplished? I don't know. Most firms are trying to address this at some level. To be successful, this type of um, firm culture has to be extended into business strategies, operational strategies, risk strategies, compliance, hiring, and compensation. So it's to adopt a, ri a risk culture with regulator regulatory stress testing as a fundamental component. Right. Um, and not just a fundamental requirement, but that can be used to the advantage of the firm. i just say it straight as this. Those firms that figure out the best way to integrate stress testing into their overall risk culture will be will have a competitive advantage versus the rest of us. Because the amount of investment that's required to, to adequately comply with these regulations is tremendous. Now you can make that investment just for the purpose of the regulatory exercise, or you can make that, that investment for the purpose of strategically positioning the firm to have a better competitive advantage in the marketplace. This affects all levels. So we heard that one of the elements of the capital plan is disbursements, okay, dividends, share repurchases, bonuses to employees. Okay. Firms with better models, with better, with better human resource alignment between the stress tests and business strategy, I'll submit, will be more successful in that's, that's Pick the third component of that disbursement: bonuses. What keeps the best talent around in this industry? It's the it's bonuses. I mean, it, it's it can't be much more brutally honest than that. Uh, this is a this is a it is while it's not universally true, it's often true that many people go into banking for you know, the direct compensation benefits of it, and to retain them there through exercises such as this, the, that is a big piece of that strategy. So those firms that are successful in aligning these requirements from the regulator with their own internal strategies, I submit will be more successful in retaining that talent and ultimately would therefore be expected to uh, be more successful in certain elements as well. So through the various forums that uh, uh, my colleagues and I participate in, a few themes are emerging, and none of these should sound you know, unfamiliar, but this is, requires a clear vision, a tone from the top. I mean, you can tell very quickly when you sit on investor calls or internal uh, uh, strategy calls with senior management, it's very easy to tell which of these senior managers believe it versus those who are trying to sell it, okay? And the, the best-in-class firms do have a clear tone for the top, and it shows, it's already showing. All key leaders must have strategic consideration of these. It's no longer the case, for example, where OCCAR, that's for finance and treasury and risk to worry about, whereas here I am in dealer financial services or some, let's say, another key business for another firm. That's not really my job. I focus on my business strategy, my customers, and let those operational elements of the bank worry about CCAR. That, that's, that's, not, that's not the way to go either. One theme that I think has, has emerged in many different places, and I've got a few references at the end of this to look at, is this requires the elimination of silos. And an adoption of a real integrated approach. One simple area is some firms have models that are used for CCAR. Some firms have models that are used for daily P&L. Other firms have, uh, or even sometimes the same firms, have other models that are used for uh, daily uh, risk reporting. The successful firms have a set of models that are either um, amenable to all of those different areas, or they're easily tailored to fit those areas. If you have a bank that says, well, we're using this model for our CCAR estimates, and we're using this model for daily P&L, 
how is a supervisor to gain confidence uh, that they're not being gamed? For example, well, why aren't the models the same? What's what's different about your daily PL model that that isn't good enough for our stress test model, or or what is it in your stress test model that's not good enough for daily PL? There's gaming going on someplace. What is it? I'm not a regulator or a supervisor, but as managers of the bank, we should be anticipating this. They're obvious questions, okay? So those, that type of alignment has to happen. And then, um, it's not just from the top, but it's from the bottom as well. We heard just a moment ago from Scott Freeman about bottom-up and top-down models. Well, we have bottom-up and top-down leadership or, th or, or thought leadership uh, in these elements as well. So as a component of all training and onboarding, uh, as a minimum, we need to expose all parties or, or all employees to this idea of strategic alignment and uh, bring it in that way. Okay, so that's the fundamental challenge. I think it's one of, of, of it's conceptual, it's of adopting a risk culture, it's of uh, integrating uh, uh, risk expectation and supervisory expectations to our business planning. But then there are many, many uh, more familiar operational challenges, and I've just listed a few here. So I'll focus a little bit here on model risk management because Scott talked about it. But um, you know, there's model governance, discover and, and discovery and inventory management of models. A firm the size of, say, Ally Financial, we have dozens of business units, dozens of operational units. Each of those units has dozens of models. They have hundreds of spreadsheets, hi models hiding as spreadsheets. How do we find them all? And how do we, how do we track them all? You know, it's, 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 we, we can ask the business uh, and operational heads for those numbers, for those things. And they, they, they uh, you know, I think they, they typically re, uh, respond pretty well, but we have to work at it. And then model validation, the expectations for increasingly rigorous, effective challenge, year on year, are getting, um, and I and think rightfully so, uh, more rigorous. Um, and this can, we can dive down into specifics, but this year, for example, we know that there is going to be a greater focus on things like liquidity management and uh, uh, spreadsheets that are used for CCAR. We need to dig into those things. Uh, challenger models, benchmarking of models, and so forth, and, and where, do, where does the responsibility for this lie? Well, I got the notice that it's just a two minute, there's a couple minutes, so I'm not going to go point by point, but just again to, re to reiterate <coughs> information systems and infra infrastructure, line of business management, treasury and finance, HR and compensation, all of these areas have very real challenges every year. So I want to leave off with just a couple references that you can look at because again from this this topic of the firm's perspective it's not something you really go out and your research on there are some industry um, uh, 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 polls and things like that there is some uh, professional service um, uh, articles uh, from each of the cycles there are a couple of books that have um, articles written in that touch on these things, uh, but these are just some of them. So anyhow, I think that's it for me. We'll next go to questions, and uh, I want to thank you all for your time and attention. <clears throat>